So hi, um, today I'm going to talk about engineering uh, the measurement of the Hubble constant. Um, and this is work, as Simone said, from the Carnegie Chicago Hubble program. Uh, compared to other cosmological teams, we are very small. Um, and the leaders are Wendy Friedman and Barry Medor. The rest of us are postdocs and students. So throughout the talk, I will have uh, headshots of the students who did the work in the corner, which you might notice. Um, I try to remember to highlight them specifically, but if I don't, that's what's going on in the corners. Um, the byline for this talk, and really about any talk about measuring the Hubble constant from the distance scale, can be summarized by this quote uh, by John Muir, who's a conservationalist who founded the Sierra Club. And he said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And the way to interpret that is when we start to measure the Hubble constant, we not only have to care about cosmology and the stars that we're using, we have to compare, we have to worry about the structure of the galaxies where we're making these measurements, the explosion mechanisms of the supernovae, the uh, gas in those galaxies. Basically, every little bit of astrophysics goes into uh, the measurement that we're making when we measure the Hubble constant. And that, I think, comes out through my talk. So the, traditionally, the way we measure the Hubble constant from the distance ladder and the way that it's typically taught in Astronomy 101 is that we start in the Milky Way uh, and we maybe measure some parallaxes or do something like that. We move out to the Magellanic Cloud and then we use some other technique and then we keep adding and adding and adding these techniques until we get to some cosmo cosmologically interesting distance, uh, which turns out to be something like dozens of megaparsecs when we get into the Hubble flow, which is somewhere between like 70 or 80 megaparsecs. Um, I don't like this way of thinking about the distance ladder because I think the, what it gives you is this sense that we just grab onto things uh, and move forward, like it's very organic, uh, when in actual, actuality we think very hard about every step in the distance ladder and it's quite engineered. So to actually think about it in the way I like to present the topic itself is actually to start out where we measure the Hubble constant and work back to the Milky Way. And this is called backward design. You use it a lot in engineering, and you also use it in course design. Uh, and the basic idea is that we're going to start with what we want to measure, think very hard about it, move backward, and then iterate and pick the best path to getting to that high precision H0. Internally, we always are aiming for some sort of 1% measure of H0. That's a semi-arbitrary number. Uh, but that's what you just have in mind, 1%. And before we start on this journey, uh, we have to start with some honest truths. So the, the distance ladder ultimately resides on using uh, supernova type 1A. The closest modern supernova 1A that we use to calibrate the supernova 1A is at 7 megaparsecs. Okay. So 7 megaparsecs in terms of using the stars in that galaxy to measure distances is only uh, attainable by using the Hubble Space Telescope or an 8-meter class facility, so for the closest object. And the reason that's important to have in your head is because <coughs> for most distances that we measure to calibrate Supernova 1A, there is one data set that is coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. There are not multiple data sets that we use to make these measurements. Because hard things, these are all very hard, are not often repeated. And that's important to keep in mind. So only for M101 could we possibly do uh, a distance from the ground. Um, and it's actually incredibly difficult to do. Uh, the local galaxies like Andromeda and the Large Magellanic Cloud and why they play so prominently in the distance scale is because different, you can get different data sets. You can do most of this work at uh, easily accessible telescopes. You can use lots of different wavelengths from the optical all the way into the mid-infrared. Um, different groups, because you can use different facilities and different data sets, different groups and scientists can work on it, and different techniques can be employed to get the distances to these galaxies. So the hard stuff is actually measuring the supernova 1A, and where we actually have or try to reach some consensus is actually here in the local group, which is why, um, why it's so hard, actually. Uh, but it's worth understanding that this will actually change with the advent of 30 meter class telescopes. We recently had uh, the Decadal White Paper survey call, um, and a group of us actually tried to envision how you might measure the Hubble constant with a 30 meter class telescope. And the answer is that distances out well into the Hubble flow will now be accessible from the ground. So you can do a stellar population distance at 100 megaparsec in uh, one to two hours of integration with a 30 meter class telescope at 100 megaparsecs. And then you can also use uh, 
gravitational time delay lensing and gravitational wave uh, sources to also measure the Hubble constant in that way. So it's worth actually thinking about the most efficient and the most engineered ways to measure distances when you move into a realm where we can do it from the ground. Okay, so let's go back in time uh, to 1929 and see the original Hubble diagram, which was postulating the redshift, which is this axis, uh, distance relation, which is what Hubble called it because Hubble didn't like to interpret what he found. He just put it straight out. Um, and so what he plotted were distances that he derived using Cepheid-type variables following the Levitt law that was discovered by Henrietta Levitt uh, in 1908 and 1912. And then he plotted that against the recessional velocity that was observed by the galaxy. These recessional velocities were actually measured by Slipher at Lowell Observatory. Uh, not everyone knows that. Hubble did not make these measurements. And there's also a typo in this figure. He actually plotted distance versus distance um, instead of velocity. <coughs> uh, but the general sense is that he plotted this, saw a relation, and calls the constant of proportionality between velocity and distance uh, H0 or the Hubble constant. And it's defined locally, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, measuring the Hubble constant over time is actually something that has been a nexus of astronomy. Um, and it's been measured many, many times over the past uh, century. So a plot here is the date of publication versus the actual H0 value. And I like to summarize this plot as we didn't know what we didn't know at the time. And I think this is actually important to keep in mind as we get um, into the crisis that's happening today. And this is a plot that John Hukra uh, made. And I, I like to use his actual plot because he was a big advocate for lots of things in science. So the original uh, guess by Lamatra, and then also the measurements by Hubble are here. Uh, you see those values were very large in the 600s, 500, 600. Uh, and the, the first major thing that happened was in 1952 when Walter Bada, who was also an astronomer, at Carnegie Observatories, uh, realized that the Cepheids that Hubble had been using are not actually a single population of objects. There's actually two populations of Cepheids. You can form a Cepheid-like variable from an intermediate population as well as a young population. And when you gleaned the younger star, or sorry, the intermediate age stars out, you actually changed the size of the universe quite dramatically, quote unquote, overnight by doing that careful work. And then as we evolve into the, as we go into the future here, what you're seeing uh, is the Palomar telescope come online, the ability to look ever further into the universe. Um, and it kind of calms down in here to the age old debate between 50 and 100 or the factor of two controversy. There's a really important point here, which is a paper by Kem Cook, Mark Aronson and Garth Illingworth when they detected the first Cepheids in M101 using charged coupled devices, these newfangled things at the time. Uh, so everything prior to this, and actually a lot of the work that continued into the 1990s, was using photographic plates. Okay. So this is the first measurement pertinent to the distance scale with CCDs. And the reason I think this is really important is because Alan Sandage in 1983 wrote a 30-page paper on the non-detection of Cepheids and M101 and what that meant. And basically, for any distances measured beyond that 7 kiloparsec, which is the closest modern supernova 1A calibrator was not based on Cepheids, but was based on these other techniques, like brightest, the brightest stars having some magical um, intrinsic metallicity and other techniques. So this is a big deal, because now we can actually measure uh, Cepheids in a lot of the galaxies that are being used. Um, and then we have this debate between 50 and 100, which was really a shouting match between Alan Sandage and Gerard de Vaucoulour, although lots of other people tried to weigh in. And it's a, really interesting it's a really interesting thing to think about historically, because one of the reasons that Alan Sandage wanted 50 was because when he made his Hubble constant measurements, he applied as a prior on his measurements the fact that the universe has to be older than the things inside of it, which is a very reasonable thing to do. But he was trying to make the universe as old as the star clusters, the ages we measured in star clusters. At the time, we thought they were something like 15 giga years old. So that's why he drove towards 50. Of course, in 19, <coughs> oops, that's actually not on here. In uh, 1998, we find out about the accelerating universe. 
And with the accelerating universe, you can have a higher H naught and very old star clusters. So there's the example of something we didn't know that we didn't know that was hiding in this H naught controversy. Uh, Wendy Friedman, uh, one of my mentors, uh, led the team that ultimately solved the factor of two controversy in 2001. And it was solved with dozens of people working very, very hard, taking detailed measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it took about a decade to actually do all of that work. Uh, and that solidified the Hubble constant at 72, plus or minus about 10%. Um, and of course, today we're in a new controversy. So the reason people get very excited is because hiding in these controversies over time have been things like the accelerating universe. So how do we actually measure the Hubble constant? The modern Hubble diagram is, is the way we do it. So the modern Hubble diagram we actually have in log-log space. And we use log-log space because that makes it a straight line. And that's conceptually easier to parse. But because at least I think don't actually think in log log space. Um, I've plotted here in all the units you could possibly think in. So you can just pick the axes that make the most sense to you. Um, so we actually measure the Hubble constant way out here in the Hubble flow. And the Hubble flow is where a galaxy's peculiar motion around its structure that it lives in is significantly smaller than its cosmological motion that pushes it out um, cosmologically. So basically, we want to minimize the uncertainty that the motion, the, the redshift that we're measuring, is due to something happening uh, locally, so going around a cluster, say. Um, and out here, the only distance indicator that works well are supernova type 1A. And so plotted here are the supernova type 1A from two projects, the Carnegie Supernova Project in red and the CFA4 survey in gray. And they have two different dispersions. And we believe that that is because one of them uses, uh, the Carnegie Supernova Project actually uses the infrared and uh, with the optical. And when you add in the infrared, you actually get a stronger handle on the intrinsic dust. I think I said that right. Um, that happens to be in the supernova. And so we think that's why the scatter there is small. But the major point is that out here in the Hubble flow, even in this diagram, which is now several years old, we have something like hundreds of supernova that we've measured and get the distances from. And that's where we get the Hubble constant. Because we have so many of them, the uncertainty that comes into the Hubble constant error budget from this part of the diagram is actually about half a percent with this sample. And there's bigger samples now. And so there's two important things to take away is that supernova, even with all the mysterious physics that may or may not be going on inside of them, are remarkable standard candles. They're precise to about 6%, even with multiple, um, multiple formation mechanisms, environments, et cetera. <coughs> and the other thing that's important to note is that to appreciably reduce this uncertainty as it goes into the error budget, we need to go from 200 supernovae to 2,000 supernovae. So to make progress here on the uncertainties and the Hubble constant you know, requires a lot of work. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that work. I'm just reminding you that that's a lot more before we're going to see any change in the Hubble constant from this term. Um, the only other way would be to figure out some reason why we can make the dispersion smaller in the population as, you know, if, if there are two clear subpopulations that emerge. Uh, people have been trying to do that for decades, and it hasn't actually fallen out uh, cleanly yet. So all of this is actually anchored onto this part of the diagram, which are the local supernova 1A calibrator sample. So these are supernovae that go off in relatively nearby galaxies that are close enough that we can independently measure their distance almost entirely with the Hubble Space Telescope. Until Reese et al. 2016, there were only eight galaxies that were in the calibrator sample. So the whole of supernova cosmology is calibrated to those eight supernova. Um, and that is a big limitation of the method. And that's actually the source, the largest source of uncertainty in the Hubble constant error budget. So that contributes uh, with the current re sample, which is more like a sample of 19 now, that contributes something between 1.5 or maybe 1% to 2% to the total error budget of um, the Hubble constant. And that's important to keep in mind, because if we really want to improve our uncertainties on the Hubble constant, we need to improve upon 
the size of this sample, which is hard. Uh, and there's the whole diagram uh, put together. Okay. So that 2% uncertainty used to not be a huge deal, so prior to reset all 2016, because the overall uncertainties were so much bigger. So it was kind of swamped in the noise. But now, as we're pushing to better and better calibrations on all fronts, it's, one of, it's the dominant term. So this is a recent plot of the Hubble constant from 2000 to 2016. Um, everything kind of cuts off in 2016, um, which shows <laughs> the key project distance in 2000, uh, Hubble constant in 2001, and the other measurements that um, uh, use the Cepheid space distance ladder. That includes um, Adam Reese's team, which their project is called SHOES. Uh, it includes working in the mid-infrared with the Carnegie Hubble program. So two different groups, two different wavelengths, ultimately underlying it all the same Cepheids themselves and the same technique but they all tend to agree with each other with error bars steadily decreasing over time. Uh, the other leading way to measure the Hubble constant is to use the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and that's plotted in red from the first release of WMAP all the way through to the 2015 release of Planck, and then there's a BAO number here as well. Um, and what's interesting about these comparisons is that you have two different telescopes and effectively two different teams uh, that sort of agree with each other, but we also have some differences over time. So there's always been an offset at some level between the CMB and the local distance ladder, but it's really only been with the Planck measurements that it's become a crisis, so to speak, or a tension that um, people are starting to be worried about. Of course, it's very important to remember that these techniques are fundamentally measuring different things. The distance ladder is measuring the local universe, so it's directly measuring the Hubble constant. Whereas the CMB modeling is actually measuring, um, measuring in the very young universe, the Z of 1100 universe, and indirectly measures the local Hubble constant by um, taking the measurements in the young universe and propagating that model back to the current day or forward to the current day uh, to get the Hubble constant. So the often cited reasons why you might have a difference between these two are some sort of astrophysical thing that we don't understand about the distance ladder, potentially something that we don't have in our CMB model, or some sort of systematics in Planck that try to explain uh, why WMAP and Planck look kind of different. So that's the kind of simple view of, of the situation. Right. And so the most recent deviation, I didn't update this, uh, now the SHOES team as of Tuesday is measuring 74.1-ish, uh, and the and the Planck value is still down here at 67, and so that's like four sigma difference between the two. Yeah? So uh, you, you put BAO at, uh, at, with the lambda CDM, like you, isn't that much more closely tied to a direct Hubble constant measurement than, um, yeah. um, So BAO is ultimately calibrated to the sound horizon in the CMB. Right. So it has, at some level, it has to agree with the CMB. What's awesome and cool about BAO is that you can measure it at different Z over time. So you can get H of Z from BAO alone, which is cool. In fact, you can get H of Z from some aspects of supernova as well. And one of the things that I think is most fascinating about this current controversy is that you can anchor either method in the local universe or in the distant universe. And in the middle, those two methods agree really well. So yeah. the question is like, where do you think BAO is actually measured? Where is that difference? Is it Z of two? Or you think it's basically, what you're really seeing is maybe Z of a thousand, right? Right, so it's calibrated to Z of 1100. Okay. It's making the measurement at Z of X, I don't actually know. Um, but it's calibrated to Z of 1100. So there were some papers that were trying to argue that, that BAO was independent, and that was actually um, a mistake in those abstracts that I believe has been corrected. But you can calibrate it locally, and it gives you the local value. So it really is a difference between anchoring in the early universe and the late time universe. And that's why it's so hard to theoretically explain, because you have to keep the middle of the universe behaving the same way, but change either side. But to anchor it locally, you need some distance. Yeah, so you, lo you so would, ultimately yeah. you're 
or right, 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 right. I mean, I'm saying the point is like basically the entirety of z of 1099 to z of one uh, is, doesn't help us with this question. It's literally something between the two anchoring points. And there's uh, several papers discussing this in the literature and why, why it might be the case. So you basically have to do something. So to solve this problem just in the modeling, you have to go to some sort of exotic kinds of semi-exotic kinds of models where you have decaying dark energy, interacting dark matter, interacting neutrinos, things like that. Because they will change things in the early universe without changing things in the local universe. But that's not what I do, so please don't ask me questions about that. <laughs> okay, so I sort of went through this, so let's go ahead and skip. So the question in terms of engineering the measurement of the Hubble constant locally is why do we have so many, so few calibrators? If this is the biggest term, what's going on? Um, and so the question that I often hear is that supernova are intrinsically rare, so supernova in a small volume located around us are also very, very rare. Um, so what I did to actually test this was I plotted up all of the known supernova, again, this cuts off in 2016, um, that are known within 80 megaparsecs. And I just picked that number because that's about twice the volume uh, where we can measure Cepheids. So Cepheids sort of cut off at around 40 megaparsecs with um, HSD uh, around. This is fluff, fluffy. Uh, and so if you look at this histogram, uh, there's more than the eight that we had in 2016, and there's more than the 19 that we currently have calibrated with Cepheids now. Uh, in fact, there's 95 supernova within supernova type 1A within 40 megaparsecs. Uh, the second thing that I often hear is, well, they must have all been discovered very recently. So we all know that these transient programs have been ramping up of late. Um, so maybe they were all found in the last couple of years and we just haven't had time to follow them up. So if supernova have their discovery year in their name. So it was a simple exercise to actually just strip off to the year and plot the discovery year for the supernovae. And you do see that after about 2000, uh, the number of nearby supernova has gone up considerably. I think that's because that's when the amateurs figured out that this was a lot of fun. Because until, literally until only a few years ago, almost all of the nearby supernova were discovered by amateurs in their backyards looking at bright nearby galaxies. Uh, and so you'll actually see that at the time that I, I cut this off, um, you know, there actually was a dearth of supernova. That year it actually bounced back up. There were three or four actually in the next year, and it's been pretty constant since. So it's not also that these 95 supernova, the bulk of them were discovered in the past um, few years. And so this actually cuts off at 1995. A number of the supernova that we use as calibrators go back to 1980. Uh, what it really has to do is the suitability of a given supernova that we've discovered to be a calibrator, which is kind of a given. Uh, but um, what that is comprised of is a question of can I characterize the supernova itself? And is it reasonable supernova? Um, and can I measure its distance? And that's how you get into the calibrator sample. So when you're characterizing a supernova, you have to find it before peak light. You have to remove the underlying galaxy or any bright sources. You have to have quality multiband light curves uh, for something like 30 to 40 days. Uh, and you need to be able to estimate the local extinction, which means you need multiband measurements. Uh, and then there's some other technical issues related with observing supernova that get folded in. And the answer is you can do this for just about any nearby supernova that's gone off in the past uh, few decades. Um, and that's because of a phenomenal effort from the supernova and transient community that I'm in complete awe of to actually follow up every single supernova that goes off within a certain volume. And so of the 95 that I listed before, uh, my colleague Chris Burns, who works on the Carnegie Supernova Project, went through every, every one of those 95, looked at the data in the archive, um, looked at the data that had been published, the data that he had on his disk, uh, and about 40 of them, about half of them, have everything that you would need uh, to be used as calibrators and meet various requirements. So the other part must cut this sample down another 50%. And that is, can I measure its distance with Cepheids? And to measure a distance with Cepheids, you need other uh, components. Uh, but first, I want to show you how you actually measure distance with Cepheids. So this is a plot from Riesenthal and Hoffman et al. 
which is the SHOES effort. Uh, and they have 19 supernova 1A host galaxies, which are plotted here. And then there are four anchor galaxies, which we use to get the absolute scale of the Cepheid period luminosity relation. And these three are our local group galaxies. And this is a mega maser host galaxy. So how you actually measure um, distances from Cepheids is you do photometry and you measure their period. Um, you typically need something like on order of 10 epochs to actually get the period. You also need to classify the Cepheid as being as what mode it's actually oscillating in. But the underlying uh, sense of the Cepheid period luminosity relationship in um, this is actually plotted in the infrared bands, J, H, and K, is that they form this relation, this very tight relationship between period and absolute luminosity that has an intrinsic scatter of about a tenth of a magnitude or about 5% in distance, which is really good. It's really amazing that it works out this well. So let's take that knowledge that the intrinsic dispersion, which is down here, is about a tenth of a magnitude and take a look at the distances that we measure uh, in the Cepheid host galaxies, the supernova 1A host galaxies. And you'll see that these plots all look uh, a little different from each other. Um, for instance, this is the, my favorite one to harp on uh, that only has four uh, detections, and two of them are strange. Um, and the question is, why do we not get equally beautiful period luminosity relationships in these galaxies? So one reason is that everything in the LMC is very nearby, and we don't have to worry about crowding. And we also get higher signal to noise measurements. So some of the dispersion, the growing dispersion that you see here, is due to the difficulty of making the photometry measurements, which is fine. But the other thing has to actually do with the host galaxies. So what I've done here is I actually pulled, with the exception of the antennae, which isn't in the SDSS footprint, SDSS images for a selection of these galaxies to give you some classes here. So NGC 4424 is this galaxy here. Uh, it basically only has star formation in the innermost parts. And because of that, you find very few Cepheids, because Cepheids are very young stars. So it needs to be forming stars. This is a beautiful face-on spiral galaxy, and you get an incredibly, a very beautiful sequence here. Um, this is actually one of the more distant galaxies, which is why the scatter is large. But you get a beautiful sequence, and you measure a beautiful distance to this galaxy. This galaxy um, actually only has star formation in its outer ring. It doesn't have any in the center because it's strongly barred. And so you get a much smaller number of Cepheids. And then, of course, our friend the Antennae is one of the dustiest, interactingest, kind of weird galaxies. And you actually have a strong bias in this galaxy towards the brightest Cepheids, uh, in part because of the dust, not necessarily because of the distance. So what you get by trying to, by mapping these Cepheid distance plots to the galaxy they host is the fact that a supernova, to be in the calibrator sample using Cepheids, has to have a distance measurable by Cepheids, obviously. And that cuts you down to relatively face-on spiral galaxies, which cuts out about 50% of the sample. Okay. So the list of things you have to do to get a distance via Cepheids the host galaxy needs to be star forming, luminous, and face approximately face on. If it meets those criteria, I have to go to the Hubble Space Telescope and get 10 to 20 epochs of optical imaging to get the period. Then I reobserve it in the IR to actually measure the distance. I really need a span of log p. I need spatially resolved metallicity information, which does not come from the stars. It comes from nebular emission lines. Um, which we could have an entire conference about measuring metallicity from nebular emission lines. Um, we need to measure lo local extinction and measure crowding and other related issues. And so this is actually a big limitation on trying to measure H naught to its highest precision possible from the distance ladder because we cut the sample down again. Um, so I like to, pro I mean, this is amazing work that's been done with Cepheids. I deeply, deeply respect it. I work with Cepheids. They are brilliant tools. Um, but if our goal is to make the most precise measure of the Hubble constant possible, we might want to think about a slightly different distance indicator that gives us access to more host systems and a broader range of properties of those host systems. Um, okay. So the rest of the talk, I'm just going to give you a sense of an alternate way to measure distances and to measure the Hubble constant. And to have a quote to go into the second part of the talk, 
Uh, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And ultimately, the new eyes that we attain are given to us by the Gaia satellite. And to explain why this gives us new eyes, um, until the Gaia satellite started releasing data, the sum in totality of all of the parallaxes that were measured better than 10% was a 100 parsec sphere around the sun. Other than that, you had to be an incredibly special star uh, to get uh, parallaxes measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's something like 30 or 40 parallaxes uh, since the age of the Hubble Space Telescope that were measured independently. Um, Gaia, however, expands this 10% error circle out to 10 kiloparsecs, uh, which basically gives us access to the entirety of the color magnitude diagram and not just special classes of stars that we can follow up with HST, very expensive HST parallaxes. So this is actually my favorite Gaia plot and it was made by Lauren Anderson, um, which shows the T gas sample plus um, some machine learning magic, uh, but just beautifully illustrates what we have access to now from Gaia. Um, and so for those of you who don't look at color magnitude diagrams all day, the x-axis is temperature, where hotter stars are bluer, uh, so smaller numbers, and redder star, or sorry, hot, cooler stars are red, so bigger numbers. Uh, and then in the luminosity axis, smaller numbers means brighter, bigger numbers means fainter. And these are all the classical sequences, the main sequence, the red giant branch, and the red clump. So if you want to apply the knowledge that we're going to gain from Gaia to the Supernova 1A calibrator sample, unfortunately, we have to block out um, mostly everything fainter than about the horizontal branch. Because even with JWST, this is only going to be accessible to us within, a, say, about 6 to 7 megaparsecs. Remember, the closest calibrator is at 7 megaparsecs. So, but above here, we might have a chance uh, of doing something in mass. This is the classical instability strip. This is where the star's stellar structure uh, makes it unstable to pulsations, and that's where the Cepheids live. And this is coarsely where it falls in this diagram. And now I've labeled uh, a number of distance indicators that fall in this bright area of space. So here on the horizontal branch, we have the red clump. The red clump is a very powerful tool. Uh, it's precise to, I think, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. But unfortunately, for things that are very far away, um, there's actually some age and metallicity uh, degeneracies there. Um, and it's actually very hard to decouple those in very distant systems. So that's not going to work for us. Uh, the R and Lyrae are also pretty wonderful. but uh, so you can get a distance to an individual star to about a percent, one to two percent in the infrared. But unfortunately, they're highly, highly, highly metallicity sensitive. And we're not going to be getting metallicities for things at 20 megaparsecs. The Cepheids we've been talking about, they're very young stars. They also have a metallicity sensitivity and, and some of the other uh, concerns. What do you mean by metallicity? So the period luminosity relationship has a metallicity term, and it's about 0.2 mag per dex. Okay, but the yes, they do. Yeah. The are useful. So. It's because they're bright. <laughs> <laughs> but right, the Cepheid metallicity term um, is is probably one of the biggest sources of uncertainty in the Cepheid distances for reasons that I could give a whole colloquium on. But um, but right, it's also a problem. Another pulsating type of star are Myras. Myras are wicked cool stars. They're actually pulsating AGB stars with dust shells and all this amazing things going on. Uh, but the fact that they have dust shells around them makes them kind of challenging for precise distances. They also have very long periods from a year to two years, or actually some of them haven't had their period measured. So that makes them difficult. Um, and they're not actually solving the, the problem that we have with Cepheids. Uh, but people are using them and studying them, and they could be a really powerful tool in the future. And of course, we're left with my favorite distance indicator, uh, which is the tip of the red giant branch. It's very bright, um, it's non-variable, and um, it works in areas of galaxies that help us get away from a lot of the problems that we have with Cepheids. A lot of the error terms, I shouldn't say problems, a lot of the terms in the Cepheid error budget 
we can alleviate by using this distance indicator. So I want to explain the tip of the red giant branch. So this is a, a schematic diagram that uh, Barry Medor made that I, I really like just for explaining how the tip of the red giant branch works. So the x-axis is color again, and the y-axis is magnitude. And each of these lines are stellar, or coarse stellar population tracks uh, with um, going from metal poor to metal rich, or um, age is degenerate. So it could also be going from old to young. Um, and the tip of the red giant branch is the truncation of the red giant branch sequence in the color magnitude diagram. Uh, and the reason that there's a truncation in the red giant branch sequence has to do with, I want to call it basic statistical physics because it's an undergraduate homework assignment. Um, basically, the core of a red giant star is degenerate over its evolution on the red giant branch. When it reaches the top of the red giant branch sequence, what has happened is that the core has grown in mass sufficient to break the degeneracy. Under degeneracy pressure, mass and temperature are coupled, which means it's reached a specific temperature. So this happens very suddenly, and then the star reorganizes itself, goes through the helium flash, and rains down onto the horizontal branch. But the key part is this it happens at a fixed mass or a fixed temperature. That means that the bolometric luminosity coming off of the core is the same in two uh, red giant stars anywhere in the universe, or basically the same, within a few percent. So then what happens is that the chemical composition of the atmosphere, coupled with the observing band that we use, gives us a modulation to the observed magnitude. And how this works is that for the very metal-rich stars in the blue, where most of the metal lines are, you get a fainter star. Compared to a metal-poor star, fewer lines in the blue, less line blanketing, it's brighter. Conversely, you go into the H-band, and now those same metal uh, atoms that were absorbing energy in the blue are now emitting thermally, such that in the H-band, that same star is brighter if it's metal rich, and it's fainter if it's metal poor. Uh, and so you see this travel through all the bands in the optical and the infrared, and the pivot magnitude happens to be, or sorry, the pivot magic wavelength happens to be in the I-band, which used to stand for infrared, but now is optical. Um, and so for stars more metal poor than about minus 0.5 dex, uh, the I-band magnitude varies very small amount within a few percent for tip of the red giant branch stars. And that's our distance indicator. And what is exciting about red giant branch stars is that they can be found in the halos, the outer part of galaxies that are edge on, face on, that are really star clusters, that are very faint, that are so faint you can't see them, uh, that have supernovae, that have four supernovae, uh, that are accessible to Cepheids, that are not accessible to Cepheids. Basically, every galaxy has old, metal core, red giant branch stars in it somewhere that we can use to measure a distance. Which means we can measure a distance to anything you'd like to measure if you give me the telescope time to do it. So the TRGB has a lot of pros. It's not variable. I only have to observe it once. The physics we've just talked about, uh, it can be applied to all Hubble types, all inclinations, all luminosity classes. It's really hard in ultra-faint dwarf galaxies because they only have one or two giant stars. Uh, but we're not measuring ultra-faints at 20 megaparsecs. Um, we can apply to low-density regions of galaxies. We don't have to worry about crowding. Because we're using old metal poor stars, there's very few differences between the stars that I measure very far away and the stars that I measure locally to calibrate. You sometimes worry that very young stars have something strange happen chemically in the galaxy or something, and they could be different. The metallicity is projected into color, which means I have a way to estimate it. It's annoying, but also powerful. Uh, a single data set to find the stars and to measure the distance. And it's a red candle, and I'll show you how that's going to be powerful with WFIRST, JWST, 30-meter uh, class telescopes. The con is that we haven't been using it for a century. Uh, there's great non-uniformity of application in the literature. If you just did a literature search today, you'd think that it's a very unstable distance indicator, and there's no trigonometric calibration. So what we've been doing for the past four years is measuring a sample of supernova 1A host galaxies for the first time. So every distance, every supernova, we have to measure for the first time. 
uh, we had to develop the photometry infrastructure to measure stars that are in the halo of our galaxy all the way out to 20 megaparsecs on the same systematic system. Uh, that's been fun. And uh, we have to collect all the ancillary data and perhaps that we need to do a direct calibration with guided parallaxes. So we've made a lot of progress on these two. This one is still ongoing, and I'm going to show you that now. So how many, um, per galaxy, how many TRDB stars do you have to measure before you say that's a TRDB? I think that'll become clear as I show you how it works. OK. So step one was build a sample. We are very lucky to be awarded about 200 orbits with the Hubble Space Telescope in 2014 to go about measuring the distances to all of these galaxies. OK, so step two was build standardized techniques, both to measure the photometry and to measure the tip of the red giant branch. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you a nearby case that's very easy. This is a galaxy at 0.784 megaparsecs, IC 1613, and a galaxy that's far away. This is NGC 1365. It is in the Fornax cluster at about 18.4 megaparsecs. Um, in both cases, we have ACS Hubble data. This is the field in I, um, NGC 1365. Here's a zoom. It's pretty much beautiful and blank, but filled with RGB stars. IC 1613 is a little bit difficult. Um, this pointing is actually uh, 30 arc minutes, no, 20 arc minutes on a side. So it's much bigger than an HST field of view. But we do have several pointings in the halo. And what we do is we actually calibrate the ground data to the space data uh, to make the distance measurement. Okay. So here are the color magnitude diagrams. These are not the idealized color magnitude diagrams I showed earlier. This is what stellar populations people really work with. So on the x-axis, you have color. And on the y-axis, you have magnitude again. And the actual definitions of these things um, are not super important. So in the nearby case, you see a beautiful red giant branch. There's that beautiful truncation right there. You also see some young stars, as you expect in a dwarf irregular galaxy, and some asymptotic giant branch stars. But it looks exactly like we expect uh, from, from theory or from our textbook. As we move farther afield, it doesn't look quite as clean. You still have a beautiful red giant branch, but that truncation uh, is not as clear. And this is mostly to do with signal to noise. We're observing something at uh, 20 megaparsecs. We're just not, it's not as clean of a measurement. But we can measure the distance quite well. So we measure the distance by collapsing or marginalizing over the color axis and plotting a luminosity function. This is binned, and I know people don't like binning, but it's binned at the precision of our photometry. So this is binned at 0 0.005 magnitude bins. It's like not binning. Um, <laughs> and what you see is a very strong uh, jump in the luminosity function at the magnitude of the tip. Uh, these, you could actually plot up a ruler and read off, and Barry loves doing that. Uh, but we want to do something a little bit more quantitative. And all we do is take the first derivative of this using a simple derivative approximator, and you get a very strong jump at the TRGB uh, magnitude. Um, and this is something you can sort of read off very cleanly, uh, which is why I like to show this before I show you what it really looks like in a supernova 1A host. So we marginalize over the color axis again, and we get this plot. And inside this, this function are things like, at the bottom of our magnitude sample, there's galaxies that we can't tell if they're galaxies or stars. Um, and there's also incompleteness that falls off. You see it here, too, but it's not as dramatic. This has been at 0.01 magnitudes. Um, and we do the same thing. We take the first derivative. We get a peak here, um, and that we call the tip of the red giant branch. Okay. So in terms of the numbers of stars that you need, it depends. If you have very precise photometry, you don't need as many stars. If you have not so precise photometry, you need a much larger number of stars. So it tends to move around depending on your observations. And I know that. Oh, I can answer a question now. Okay, I'll wait for you to finish your sentence. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I know that because the way we actually determine uncertainties on these measurements is to simulate the whole thing end to end with artificial stars. So we put in artificial stars and pull them out through our whole measurement procedure, calibrating the photometry, doing everything. And then we subsample those into idealized luminosity functions from our input, 
and ask the question, what do I actually measure at the end of the day? And from that, we see how things play with number of stars, precision of the photometry. Um, the other thing you have to worry about is contamination from other populations. So it's not an easy answer. There's three things sort of playing together. And those diagrams look like this. They're crazy. But basically, the underlying thing is that we put in, if you put in this sharp function, you pull out this smooth function because of all the uncertainties going into our measurements. And then we measure the tip of the red giant branch using the same algorithm, using different smoothing scales and different things to actually get our uncertainties and actually pick what we think is the most precise measurement. Um, you can see the same thing uh, for our more distant galaxy, where you see that same idealized function. It's a little different because we have more what we think are asymptotic giant branch stars, so that no, that's up a little higher. But you can see how in the, in the output, which is in blue, you get that smooth rollover that looks a lot like the function that we actually observe. So now your question. Yeah, so I mean, one advantage of doing something like a Cepheid or something like that is that you're looking for a, a mean. So your statistics you know, go down quite well. Whereas here you're doing like an edge detection, which, I mean, it's a derivative, so it's intrinsically noisier. And I just worry that you're more biased by small numbers of extreme objects. Uh, because you're, I mean, as you can just see in that one, it's, you know, small numbers of things near your transition mm -hmm. can bias you more. They could, but I think if, if we actually did, you know, worked out all the things that can bias the Cepheid measurements, there's the same things are concerns for the Cepheids. Like there's some concerns that we can never get around, which are things like there are objects that are going to bias our photometry or might bias our measurement. But you still have to worry about, about that with Cepheids. You are taking a mean of a large number of objects, but effectively, I could also just circle these and take a mean. Uh, it's still an edge. Yeah, it's still an edge, but there's different ways to go about it. This is just one way of detecting the edge. Okay. This was a way that we could explain cleanly, that we can model, that we can demonstrate for the technique. I don't think this is the end way to actually make this measurement. You can imagine doing cross-correlation. Uh, you can imagine doing more complicated ways of looking for the edge. You could do, actually, you could do uh, synthetic photometry diagrams and do it that way. There's lots of different ways to measure it. This is just the one that worked right now. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. I hate those diagrams. Um, <laughs> they're just so complicated and convoluted. Um, so these are the color magnitude diagrams for all of the galaxies that we're looking at. And I like to show this because here's the beautiful sort of textbook CMD for M32 which we hope to be an anchor in the future. And this is the kind of photometry that we're looking at for our Supernova 1A host, like way down at the bottom on the same scale. Um, and this was to demonstrate uh, the challenges inherent to doing this photometry. We have to do photometry on this system and this system and say that I understand that they're on the exact same system and that there's no difference between the photometry here and there. So I have to characterize all of my uncertainties. So literally for the past year, I've been working on doing that. And we're not 100% there. <laughs> it's very hard, uh, because this is a diagram that has 12 magnitudes on it. Okay, But we're, we're working that way. Another thing that I want to highlight about the tip of the red giant branch is how important it is actually to be out in the halo out here. So this green pointing is ours. The other pointings are archival pointings. Uh, and these are the CMDs. This is ours. This is where I claim a sub percent, uh, sorry, a one or two percent distance. And these are the fields that are in the disk. And what's important to note here is how much as you go into the galaxy, we're getting more stars, but we're also getting more contaminating populations. And what's most important is we're actually starting to look through dust. So this is an H1 map of M101. Here's our field out on the outer part. And this is where these additional fields are. And you tend to measure a more distant distance to M101, in part because you're looking into these dust clouds. And most of the stars are in the disk in these fields. Um, so that's a very important thing to keep in mind. I've actually spent months trying to figure out why my distance was so far in the foreground of M101 compared to all these, which actually meant just reducing all of this data and measuring, measuring it again. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The good news is we can usually predict this stuff where we're going to get enough stars uh, using H1 maps, which exists for most nearby large galaxies, 
and using surface brightness profiles. So this is the Y surface brightness profile and the Galex surface brightness profile, which lets us avoid things like the extended disk, but also make sure that we have enough red giant branch stars from the Y's one. So we can actually predict a priori where to put our fields using data that exists uh, and be pretty sure that we're going to get a good measurement out at the end of the day, which is important. For something like NGC 4442, sorry, 4424, there's a very large number of supernova 1A have 44 and 2 in the name. I get them all confused. Um, where there were only a handful of Cepheids, um, we don't have to worry about that risk. Direct calibration um, will come from Gaia eventually. We're still edging our way out to this 10 kiloparsecs. And one of our biggest challenges has actually been for the highest precision Gaia stars, they're actually the magnitudes in the literature are only measured from photographic plates or from the wings of the stellar profiles and surveys. So for stars that are going to have sub percent parallaxes, they have 20% magnitude uncertainties. It's just mind blowing. So we have a suite of robotic telescopes operating every night down at Las Campanas, collecting photometry in the bands that we actually use to make these measurements so that we can try to calibrate this in advance of the spectrophotometry finally being released. So here's a sample of stars and their Hipparchus parallaxes. These are real distance errors. Well, they're not actually real distance errors because once the parallax is so huge, what does error mean anymore? But um, this is the Gaia GR1 results for the same stars. And you see that the blob is actually forming itself into a red giant branch. Um, we've been slowed because of some technical issues down at Las Campanas, but we're still building the sample. Um, and it's not quite enough yet for us to publish a, a distance directly from parallax. So in the meantime, we're using these local group galaxies. Um, here are some examples of the photometry using that same pipeline uh, as calibrators. So hopefully I've demonstrated that we're making a lot of progress on using the tip of the red giant branch as an end-to-end -end way to measure the Hubble constant. So in the last five minutes, uh, I really want to, oh, sorry, I'm going to skip that. Oh, no, actually, this is more important. So we've built an entirely parallel distance ladder. And what have we learned? So this is an example of all the distances that have been measured to IC1613. And there's a lot to unpack in this plot. But the basic idea is we think we know the distance to IC1613. And most of the techniques agree. Cool. So when we make our measurements in supernova hosts that also have Cepheid distances, we're effectively testing all the things that we think might go wrong in a distant Cepheid host. Crowding, metallicity effects, differences in the IMF, whatever, whatever you want to test. But for our seven supernova hosts that we've published, and we have a handful more on disk, um, we actually have something like 17 objects, I think, that we can do this comparison in the HNOT paper that we expect to submit in the next couple of months. Everything agrees in the mean within a few percent, within about 2% between Cepheids and tip of the red giant branch. So you might say that we've learned nothing because we get the same roughly. Um, but we've actually learned that a lot of those things that everyone is concerned about don't seem to matter very much in the mean. Now, breaking this down galaxy by galaxy, supernova by supernova is going to be a lot of fun because there are some outliers that uh, probably are telling us something. Uh, so completely parallel distance ladder, probably going to get a very similar H naught because our distances seem to agree in the mean. But that's important. But the real reason why the, super, why the TRGB is exciting is when we think about the future, which is completely in infrared. And I'm just going to step through this plot, and then I'll be done and let you free. Um, so this is a plot that is complicated. It's for NGC 6822. And we have the same color axis on the bottom but I'm going to plot the magnitudes in B, V, R, I, J, H, K, L, and M. So here's what is accessible to us with Hubble, the James Webb, and W first. So we're going to start in our familiar I band that we've been talking about. So here's the tip of the red giant branch stars, and we highlight them here. And here are the Cepheids in this little galaxy. When we look at the same stars in the blue, uh, here's that, gen that sloping down of the TRGB that we understand from theory, and here are our Cepheids. And this is why, in 1929, uh, Cepheids were absolutely the way to go. You can see how much brighter these guys are. It's absolutely the only tool that we had available. If we move into the infrared, however, 
Uh, here's that upward sloping TRGB and those same Cepheids. As we move into the infrared, the TRGB is as bright as, if not brighter than, the faint end of the Cepheids, or actually half the Cepheid sequence. And I only have to get to these magnitudes one time. I don't need resolved things to get periods. So it's much more efficient. You can keep pushing it into the L and the M, into the mid-infrared, but things get interesting because stars don't really have color in the, infrared, in the far mid-infrared. So we don't get separation of the populations like, like you do in the other bands. Um, so we're working very hard on developing uh, the near-infrared tip of the red giant branch. Um, Meredith Durbin, who's in the FAT collaboration, the Pan-Chromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury, is basically taking all of their beautiful multiband CMDs and having a field day um, testing when this works, what numbers, what star formation histories, all this kind of stuff. So that will be really exciting. Um, and we can also apply this to the LMC with two mass. So this is the LMC and tip of the red giant branch stars from two mass. What we're able to do is actually divide up into cells that have equal numbers of stars and measure the distance in each cell. And what you're actually able to resolve just from the infrared tip, tip of the red giant branch is the actual structure of the LMC. So there's the bar, which is kind of tilted. One of these sides is actually 30 dorata, so it's just very heavily extincted, and the other side is literally further away. You actually see the disk, which is also tilted, and then the halo also, or the very extended disk, also has a tilt. So we're actually able to resolve the interior structure of the LMC using this technique, which is really powerful. Uh, so to summarize, um, this might not be the technique that we use at the end of the day to get the most precise measurement of the Hubble constant, but there's a quote from Alan Sandage who says, it's got to be fun. I don't think anyone should tell you that he slogs his way through 25 years on a problem, and there's only one reward at the end, and that's the value of the Hubble constant. That's a bunch of hooey. Uh, the reward is learning all the wonderful properties of the things that don't work and doing science with that. Uh, so in my mind, uh, we've put forward a way, a path forward uh, to do more cosmology, to calibrate more things. Uh, and it might not be what we actually exploit to solve the problem with the h not tension, but having an open mind uh, to new techniques and new ways of approaching the problem is important in cosmology because we don't know what it is that we don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you.